I did not know the first day enough to take the mic off of my lapel after I did my stand-up in the parking lot at Shea Stadium in New York, and I walked away and knocked over the tripod because I was still hooked up to everything. I'll spare you my big break in radio because it would take about an hour and a half to tell you, but my big break getting into television uh, has so many familiar names involved in it, and it ends with, by sheer happenstance, my television career starting at CNN in New York as their fill-in national sports reporter and being paired with somebody with whom I was completely simpatico, as they say, a producer who was a little bit more of a veteran in the business than I was, but we didn't know each other well, but we'd met. His name was Phil Griffin. I did not know the first day enough to take the mic off of my lapel after I did my stand-up in the parking lot at Shea Stadium in New York and I walked away and knocked over the tripod because I was still hooked up to everything. So Phil and getting to work with Phil at that formative stage in my career at a CNN that was very experimental and you know, you have a crew for five minutes, you better figure out something to do with it, was a priceless opportunity and uh, the personnel could not have been better. And in short, a very famous newspaper TV sports critic and previous to that a sports editor named Stan Isaacs wrote a column about some of my radio work. The column was reprinted in the national edition of the Washington Post, which was what Rick Davis, the operative head of CNN Sports, used to read every Sunday morning. And he swore to me, Davis swore to me, he was looking through the paper going, well, we've got a good sports cast here at CNN, but we don't have anybody who's funny. Oh, what's this? And there was the column about the funny stuff I was doing on radio. There was a baseball strike that year. Debbie Segura, who is now Debbie Dobbs, was the CNN correspondent in New York, and her then boyfriend, Lou Dobbs, uh, took a vacation once the baseball strike was settled, and because they went on vacation hurriedly, uh, Rick Davis and Bill McPhail asked me to fill in for the woman who's now Mrs. Lou Dobbs. That's how I got started at CNN, and eventually I got that job full-time, and the rest of it is, you know, 700,000 pages on Wikipedia. I might have been, I don't know, eight, nine, ten when I stopped watching McHale's Navy reruns at six o'clock and put on the news with Jim Jensen or any of the other, other people who were on the air in New York, and Bill Butel and Roger Grimsby, and began to watch those broadcasts as a student. Good evening, I'm Bill Butel. I had different daydreams than most 10-year-olds did, but I had a, a daydream that when I grew up, there would be a time when there'd be a sports network, nothing but sports, and there'd also be a news network, nothing but news, and that I would work for both of them at the same time. And I haven't really pulled at the same time off yet. I'd had an internship at Channel 5 in New York, half news, half sports, again, foretelling the future. It was a great experience. It was a wonderful old-fashioned newsroom where the news director and one of his reporters had a fist fight one day, and you know. And they were all super to me and tried to help me advance. And one day somebody said, hey, there's somebody we forgot about. We can send you to this guy who is the husband of a woman who used to write the news for us. And he'd be perfect. I don't think there's a job in it or anything, but he, he's gotten very far very fast. And what the man said was, I wanted to be a sportscaster when I got out of college. I was offered a job as the weekend sportscaster at Channel 5 in Syracuse, being paid $10,000 a year. He said, however, being from New York, I wanted to work here. He said, I'd also had an internship at, at Wide World Sports. They offered me a job as a production assistant for $10,500 a year. By the time I saw him, he was five years into his career there, and he was the vice president of, of program planning. And he said, I still want to be a sportscaster. I will now have to, to quit my job at $100,000 a year and moved to Syracuse to get that weekend job, and they now pay $11,000, not $10,000 a year in Syracuse. So his, his advice to me was, if you want to be on the air, be on the air. Do whatever you have to do, go wherever you have to go to do it. And the punchline to this, of course, is that the man that they sent me to see in 1979 was named Bob Iger.